we were really well prepared for 2022. And so for us, we kind of stand back and say, we're ready for this new, potentially new macro regime with a bit higher inflation, or maybe just a bit higher macro volatility on things like GDP, like inflation, the different tensions on geopolitics, be it trade or be it um, conflict. I think we're in a really good position for that um, going forward. So, you know, we've never really loved the idea of a, a really simple 70-30 portfolio. Having said that, if, you know, you don't have the resources or bandwidth and your, your fees are a real problem or, you know, behavioral risks are a real problem, you know, a 60-40 or 70-30 portfolio, that could be a great way to go. Um, but if you are willing to be a bit more thoughtful, deploy a lot more resources, um, I think being you know more diversified and mindful of the different regimes and opportunities that are out there, then that's a great way to go forward as well. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. For me, the best part of my podcasting journey has been the opportunity to speak to a huge range of extraordinary investors from all around the world. In this series, I have invited one of them, namely Alan Dunn, to host a series of in-depth conversations on the topic of what it takes to be a world-class allocator. In today's world, portfolio construction is fast moving to the top of the agenda of many investors as they try to analyze and understand the riskiness of their portfolios. And with ever increasing uncertainty around the globe, being well diversified across many different strategies and themes in your portfolio can mean the difference between ruin and survival when the next crisis emerge. The aim of these conversations is to try and understand the experiences that have influenced these highly specialized allocators and the processes they follow to harness the best returns for their clients so that we can all become better informed investors. And with that, Please welcome Alan Dunn. Thanks for that introduction, Niels. Today I'm joined by Peter Madsen. Peter is CIO of Utah School and Institutional Trust Fund's office. That's the state of Utah's sovereign wealth fund. Peter and his team manage about $3.5 billion in assets. Uh, Peter has been working in the investment industry over a number of years. Uh, he has served a range of institutional clients as a consultant and uh, investment manager. Prior to joining Sitfo, he was uh, managing director of Cube Capital Group in London. Peter, how are you today? Good to see you. Likewise. Thanks for hosting me. Uh, long time listener, first time caller, as they say. I'm a, a big uh, Top Traders Unplugged fan, so it's good to be on the on the podcast. Good stuff. Well, I guess you know the drill then that we like to get people to talk a little bit about their background before we get into the meat of the conversation. So maybe tell us uh, how you get involved in markets and investing in, in the first place. Yeah, it was a bit of a circuitous path. I uh, wasn't quite sure what to do with myself uh, early on. So maybe call it uh, late bloomer in some ways with regards to investing. But my undergrad was in Russian and Really, the uh, last year or so, I decided I was more interested in uh, policy or economics. And uh, when I went to grad school, then directly after undergrad, uh, was started out in the policy program. Uh, it was called Commercial Diplomacy at uh, Middlebury. And uh, ultimately, and on uh, one of the first days, uh, orientation day, someone asked if I wasn't I really glad I was in the MBA program. And I realized that was actually some kind of message or sign. So I quickly took the uh, GMAT and switched over to the MBA program and started learning finance and, you know, more of a quantitative uh, approach to finance, et cetera. And that's, um, and then ultimately, you know, ultimately just ended up with a bit of luck getting a job with uh, a group that spun out of Russell and was working on uh, management consulting for investment managers. And then from there, just stayed focused on institutional investing. 
Good stuff. Um, and obviously now in your role, you're CIO of the uh, this portfolio uh, at Sidfo. Um, so maybe for people who are not familiar with how that's set up and what, what the uh, entity is looking to uh, fund or achieve, maybe if you could give us a, a bit of background on that. Yeah, of course. The We're a as you said, we're effectively a sovereign wealth fund for the state of Utah. There are, if I'm not mistaken, 22 of us. We're all slightly different. We all follow a, a framework that was set out by Thomas Jefferson. And depending on how well or yeah, how successful you've been in trying to manage that original investment policy, if you will, or governance framework that was put into each individual state's constitution, uh, you know, you may be more or less constrained. And we, uh, when I started in 2015, we worked to amend the constitution to allow us to be more properly diversified. Um, but we still have what is uh, we, what we refer to as a corpus. So the, there's a land management group. They, like many other sovereign wealth funds, try and optimize or maximize the revenues they can generate from the lands that they hold in trust for benefit of uh, public education. And then we uh, manage that portfolio of financial assets, but any contribution they make, we're not allowed to spend or distribute. So there is a, an interesting constraint on how we can uh, build the portfolio. We need to be mindful of volatility as we have a, what we call a corpus and a, an earnings portfolio where the earnings is free to uh, distribute or use for expenses, fees, et cetera, but not the corpus. Okay. So in terms of the overall portfolio, then uh, how, how would you um, kind of characterize that? It's obviously an absolute return, I guess, objective, but as you say, you're trying to minimize uh, 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 volatility and drawdown. And uh, and is it fair to, so uh, did I understand correctly that there is an annual kind of draw on the portfolio? Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's right. We have a 4% distribution. There's a policy, there's a formula around that, but effectively it's has a cap at present of 4%. And uh, believe it or not, we're going to try and amend the constitution again this year. So uh, check back with us in uh, mid-November, see how that goes, but hopefully it'll get up to 5%. We think we can support uh, inflation plus 5% because we have both the land assets generating revenue as well as the financial assets. And that four at present and potentially 5% distribution annually, we want to make sure that that's quite stable. So our distribution policy looks back five years and there's some other stabilizing factors in there like population growth, student enrollment, et cetera. And um, as we look at that really slow uh, moving distribution where it increases just modestly over time, assuming that over five-year rolling periods, our return is positive. That equates to us wanting to meet or exceed CPI plus five for our investment target. I think that's pretty common and uh, that's not a you know, unique to us. The one aspect though that I think is slightly different, may, well, I think most folks would say, but we definitely don't have a priority on measuring ourselves against peers. So we're really focused on that CPI plus five outcome over the long run. And we have, of course, a a benchmark that looks at our asset allocation to see how well we're implementing and it helps manage risk and uh, communicate with the trustees that we have you know, looking at that framework. But that uh, we really want a narrow confidence interval around CPI plus five. We're not really trying to be, you know, beat it by two or 300 basis points and uh, take on the extra volatility given that corpus framework that I mentioned. So really prioritize the the drawdown when, when working on uh, asset allocation. That's a big focus, less so a simple volatility number. Okay, interesting. So um, maybe just taking that a step further then, so what does that look like or what does that lead you to in terms of asset allocation? And I guess, you know, broad, more broadly, how, how do you think about asset allocation? Yeah, we, um, we uh, was fortunate enough to hear um, Harry Markowitz and Peter Bernstein speak and uh I think Peter Bernstein referred to the 60, he might be the originator of the 60-40 portfolio, or at least he referenced it as kind of the the simple, you know, almost equal weighted version where it's, uh, you're not really making any decisions. And Markowitz actually just said that, you know, the best starting point or the best portfolio is just 50-50, uh, for example. So 
equal weighting something is the good starting point. And, you know, that resonated with me. And as you go forward and you think of all the different asset classes you might want to avail yourself of, um, and you equal weight those, it might be a great portfolio on paper, but maybe it's not practical. Maybe the volatility is too high or the returns too low, uh, liquidity factors, et cetera. But as we built our asset allocation, that was a, a type of a starting point. And then we use um, broad categories. Uh, we have growth, real assets, in- income, and defensive. And most of those are risk-oriented. Defensive has volatility, but it's not. It's meant to not have any equity beta. But then we have public and private in each of those. Not in defensive. That's all public. But the and and highly liquid. When we put those in the optimizer, we're trying to have just public equity, private equity, public income, private income, et cetera, and um, and work with you know running the down the, what we call mean downside instead of mean variance optimization. Uh, we're currently working on a conditional expected drawdown. We have a couple of uh, risk focused analysts here, and that's something that we're working on internally. And we're also looking at uh, working with a third party too. Well, we're on a more of a multivariate optimization that looks at things like liquidity, um, inflation regime, uh, other types of regimes, as well as, uh, and then we can use a more of a real volatility, if you will, when you include private markets. So when we put all that together, uh, we're, we have a little less equity beta, I think, than many of our peers, especially you know permanent capital oriented groups as we A, want to make sure that we don't breach that corpus and B, we want to make sure that that distribution is really stable. So it's uh, 43.5% in growth, 30.5% is in public equity, 13% private equity. That's All of those are broken down and split up by quite a few different strategy flavors, as you might imagine, and a little bit of hedge funds and venture and buyout, et cetera, across those. And, and real assets, we also have a public and private, again, very uh, open to what's included, but we want that to be primarily uh, inflation linked. So we look for either co- short, uh, shorter duration kind of contract or exposures to inflation, as well as commodity exposure. And uh, naturally, we get some equity beta in there, which we're okay with, but we, we try and avoid duration in that bucket. And income, that's more of a credit oriented or call it a, a moderate equity beta portfolio where we break it out by corporate credit securitized or you know, consumer structured credit, and then emerging markets, debt, insurance, linked securities. So all of those kind of, their various hedge fund flavors you might imagine in that bucket. And then private debt, uh, again, quite opportunistic or quite diversified. And defensive, I think is pretty interesting in that some folks would call it uh, like crisis risk offset or something to that effect. We have cash, uh, short-term tips, uh, 30-year strips, and uh, macro and trend or CTA strategies broadly. Interesting. So I think, yeah, I think probably fair to say relative to a lot of endowment type investors, certainly less kind of economic equity uh, beta, as you say. And I mean, is that primarily driven by the the kind of concern around drawdown and, 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 and the desire to be kind of delivering a, a more consistent return profile? It is driven by that. It's also consistent with uh, a personal investment philosophy I have that there are uh, plenty of um, opportunities to generate equity-like returns, uh, maybe lower risk, maybe higher risk, but uh, diversifying uh, hopefully over the long run. And we're and as you step back and think about you know how much equity exposure you have through all the various types of markets um, that we invest in, we just don't feel that it's super important to load up on either public equity or private equity. I think a moderate amount of both is is sufficient. We still have, you know, it's still the primary driver of risk in the portfolio, but uh, we're we're a little more sensitive to volatility, especially uh, drawdowns, and equity is you know the primary culprit there. And is that? I mean, it's interesting because I was reading a piece by Edward Macquarie recently. I don't know if you saw this paper where he's did a reassessment of the long-term returns of equities and it was kind of in, in response to obviously Jeremy Siegel wrote his book and it seemed to be very much a slam dunk that anybody, you know, with a long-term mindset should be almost exclusively in equities. And then Macquarie's analysis looked at a different data set for the 1800s. So you might 
question how relevant that is. But then in the international sphere, obviously, there have been prolonged periods of, you know, individual countries where equities underperform for a, for a long time. So is kind of that part of your thinking, a, a, a kind of a bit of a skepticism of being all in on equities? Yeah, most definitely. I've, I, uh, I read that research with, I have to admit, I was, I, I was with a bit of glee uh, and heard him interviewed and he's a really interesting uh, presenter and apparently he'll be on some panel somewhere with uh, Jeremy Siegel, which would be nice to be uh, in the room on that. But yeah, that's, it, it's, you know, when you look back through, through longer periods of time or just open your mind to, you know, what might be possible in the future, so, you know, not necessarily relying on any historical analysis, you can make some assumptions that pretty easily look to different type of uh, macro regimes or just, you know, where multiples are, where they might head or in, in conjunction. And you could have it, you know, obviously we've had, or you, you know, we could have another 10 plus year period where equities actually, you know, at some point have zero or negative return. And meanwhile, there are lots of, call it, uh, you know, uh, strategies that have some kind of carry or some kind of income associated with them. And that's you know, guaranteed, so to speak, or that's contractual, I should say. And you can get that across various types of collateral, real estate, agriculture, um, consumer, insurance linked, as I mentioned. And that seems like a reasonable, uh, you know, if you can get a CPI plus five or close enough to that type of return with those kinds of strategies, then they should be given their due in the portfolio instead of, I think, I think a lot of folks, you know, rightly so with permanent capital, look to a really long time horizon and think, you know, yeah, we'll have a period of 10 or so years of, of zero returns, but that's okay. We have a, you know, 50 or a hundred year horizon, but it's just really hard to actually manage to that, that time horizon, I think. Interesting. And, um, I mean, you talk about kind of the various economic scenarios that could unfold, as you say, different regimes, different, uh, environments. I mean, as you take that and look at the current markets, I mean, do you form strong opinions and do you let current markets uh, kind of guide the asset allocation much? And and in particular, you know, going back a couple of years, you know, a lot of people said, you know, bond yields are very low, 60-40 is risky. And, you know, it proved to be a, a good observation. 2022 proved the point that bonds and equities can go down together. But then we had 2023, equities said, well, bonds held in, and now bonds look interesting, you know, obviously at higher yields. So kind of 60, 40 is back to an extent. I mean, looking through that whole period, has that impacted your thinking in any way or, or not? Maybe starting with the kind of the point about the macro regime and how that might influence us. We have, uh, we were a pretty small team. We're about 12 people in total, and that includes some admin operations, finance, et cetera. We have a, a small, what we call strategy and risk team. Everyone wears more than one hat on the, on the investment team, but there are a few of us that focus on what I'd call strategy and risk. And we use the macro environment to try and inform our decision making, uh, in, in to some extent, or at least just to have the broader context so that we'll try and understand, you know, our, our we call it the grid framework. We have growth, real assets, income defensive. And if you think about the um, Bridgewater, I think they were the uh, authors or architects of that, um, you know, the different regimes and kind of risk parity. Well, we're not doing risk parity. We are looking at those different regimes, the potential for, say, low growth and low inflation or some combination of those two. And so that's how our portfolio is constructed. And then when we look to the macro regime, we look to maybe we put some uh, tilts on. More so, though, we're redirecting, or, or I should say, directing cash flows. So as I mentioned, we have revenues coming in each uh, month, small amounts of revenue each month. And then we have uh, that distribution. We actually send it out quarterly. So that gives us a chance to either lean in or lean out of certain parts of the portfolio incrementally. So we looked at that macro regime of you know basic leading indicators and uh, you know, research providers that assist with that to be a bit more sophisticated. And then we have valuation and uh, momentum models where we look to um, understand and you know, have a systematic framework of what might be attractive from a valuation and momentum perspective. And you know those things generally have some rhyme uh, to them over time. So that's how we kind of inform you know, the marginal cash flows, if you will. And then as we, as, as we built the portfolio originally, given my, 
my comments earlier about you know, not being part of the, maybe you could call it the cult of equity, and then thinking about a more diversified portfolio that does well or has the opportunity to do well in a multitude of different regimes. We were really well prepared for 2022. Uh, we've, you know, we've underperformed, underperformed a 70-30 call it for the you know, five or so years leading up to 2022. It really outperformed in, in uh, 22 and kind of kept pace in 23. And so for us, we kind of stand back and say, we're ready for this new, potentially new macro regime with a bit higher inflation or maybe just a bit higher macro volatility on things like GDP, like inflation, the different tensions on geopolitics, be it trade or be it um, conflict. I think we're in a really good position for that um, going forward. So, you know, we've never really loved the idea of a, a really simple 70-30 portfolio. Having said that, if, you know, you don't have the resources or bandwidth and your you know, fees are a real problem or, you know, behavioral risks are a real problem, you know, a 60-40 or 70-30 portfolio, that could be a great way to go. Um, but if you are willing to be a bit more thoughtful, deploy a lot more resources, um, I think being you know more diversified and mindful of the different regimes and opportunities that are out there, then that's a great way to go forward as well. Obviously, you know you'd say you're not part of the cult of equity, but at the same time, equities are pretty much the the, the largest allocation and definitely probably the largest risk allocation. As a, as an allocator like yourself, you know, in terms of thinking about future returns, um, you know, it strikes me if you read the kind of research out there, there's a wide variety of opinions as to what future equity returns might look like. Uh, you know, I think GMO published their seven-year forecasts that always seem to have negative, uh, you know, returns for, for in real terms for U.S. equities going forward. And, you know, at the other end, you know, they're, Jeremy Siegel himself, as you say, I uh, you know, is in, I think there's 7% more upside in, in this year alone for equity. So uh, always kind of a broad range of views. And, you know, in a sense, uh, you know, I guess it'll, it, it will dep- probably depend on the regime. Like, obviously, if we went back into a regime of higher yields, you could have a big re-rating of uh, PE multiples, but, th- but that's a big unknown. So, how do you think about that in terms of what, what, what's a reasonable return expectation for, for, for equities in the public and, and the private space? Yeah, we, we, uh, when we run through our asset allocation every year, we do it as a more of a stress test and you know, a, a thought exercise than you know, actually looking to change the, you know, what's supposed to be a long-term target, right? So we still collect capital market assumptions. We call them CMAs. From, uh, we work with a couple of consultants and advisors, independent research shops, and we uh, also collect, monitor in the industry broadly. So, you know, folks like JP Morgan and, as you mentioned, GMO, AQR, all these folks publish capital market assumptions. We try and aggregate them up, and then we have a group that we call valuation sensitive, which would be the, the, the few and far between, like research affiliates and GMO, we put them into a category we have an industry average, and then we work with our consultants to actually try and get closer to how we're implementing. So, for example, if you know we don't just have a high yield allocation, we have you know structured credit, et cetera. We try and customize those capital market assumptions. When you look at them, as you say, the valuation sensitive folks have a you know call it a zero real return from U.S. large cap. But if you looked at that year to year and tried to use it to inform your decision making, you know, you'd be either almost no equities are underweight, you know, persistently over time. And, you know, we don't think that's a great idea. So we try and look across those averages and just come up with the different scenarios that might happen. And most consultants don't want to go to their clients each year or every two or three years and say, you know, guess what? Your your new allocation of public equity should be, you know, 15 points lower. Or to say differently, they don't want to say your your expected return of seven point five is now five point five on your total portfolio. So they shade those, they move those, call it fifty basis points one way or another, um, at the most year over year. So if you think about that framework and you think about what numbers come out of there, potential range would be something over the ten year period for U.S. large cap, for example, or maybe call it global equity, just because even though that's a because that's 60 or 70 percent US, um, there's a range of it was call it a zero to, to plus five real return over the 10-year horizon. And 
you know, we'll lean into, uh, you know, over or underweight based on, again, our, our macro, our valuation and, and momentum kind of framework more so than say drop or change the asset allocation, but go forward expected returns on us large cap look pretty difficult just given where multiples are now. Okay. And obviously within each of growth and real assets and income, um, you have public and private in, in, in each category. Well, I guess it's interesting because, you know, with the, in this debate that we're hearing now about 60, 40, you know, you hear some people saying it's now going to be say for 40, 30, 30 and 30 is in privates or for some people it's 30 in alternatives, but obviously you've done what, what I think is the right thing to do is putting the privates within the asset class rather than having them as a, a distinct category. But I mean, from your perspective, is that just capturing, you know, what's, I suppose the standard view is it's the illiquidity premium. Is is that how you see it or, or, or what's the rationale of splitting between public and private? When we look at private markets, you know, a long time ago, to call it 20 years ago, when um, I was getting started in the business, you know, hedge funds were an asset class and you, you'd have a line item called hedge funds or absolute return, line item called private equity or real estate. And uh, while those are, you know, obviously very different strategies, you know, public equity, private equity, or hedge funds, et cetera, those, the underlying exposures are what you're after. And then maybe the vehicle is, you know, related to the business model. So as you say, we, we think of private equity as, you know, equity beta. Um, we, we do avail ourselves of when the proper, I guess you could call it, or official statements come out and we use the volatility that, that uh, we're provided by the consultants when they calculate performance or the custodians. That's a benefit to us. So that's a feature, not a bug. So that's one reason to uh, include private markets. But the other is a huge part of the economy, a huge part of the investable opportunity set are private uh, securities or private assets. And as you know, I think that the, I don't remember the numbers, but the number of public companies is shrinking. The number of listed companies is shrinking. And the number of private companies is actually growing, not just I don't think it's just a, a proportional, but as the economy grows more broadly, it's more in the private markets. And that is uh, an opportunity for just, you know, call it diversification. Um, like I said, that volatility, as Cliff Bassness calls it, volatility laundering. That's a feature for some of us, not a bug. You can model the risk. You can model the liquidity risk. And while I'm not sure if there's a liquidity premium or discount, um, I think there's a debate there. There's a pretty solid uh, bit of evidence that the, the leverage these folks are able to use and the value add or, or from operations, you know, acquisitions, building companies, growing revenues organically as, as well, that should provide some strong outperformance versus, say, just being a shareholder in a company that you think is going to be um, outperforming. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But being able to be hands-on, be in control of the leverage and in control of operations, I think should provide some premium to public markets, but that's a, just a pretty basic standard view. Yeah. And I mean, you touched on this debate with Chris Cliff Asner's volatility laundering, et cetera, and it is a bit of a bugbear of people in the, in the hedge fund industry that, that the private markets are marked less frequently and seem less volatile. I guess the key question is, I mean, do you think in an, in a severe economic downturn, have you got more equity risk in the private side than in the potentially or, or, or not? Depends on the amount of uh, leverage that's involved and the quality of the companies. M maybe the sector exposure matters. Say, for example, venture. And if, there, if AI turns out not to be anything at all, then you know there's going to be a, a world of hurt in our, in our venture exposure. Um, but generally speaking, I think that the equity beta in private markets, it's, it's difficult to calculate uh, you know, we try and look at that. We try and model it. Th th there's a couple of ways of thinking of it. One is those marks, th those sensitivities are real, but they will be marked at a lag. And so as we calculate that equity beta, we have the benefit of it being um, diversified by a call at time. So as the public markets are drawing down, they're informing the private markets. And in a world like uh, COVID or something that uh, maybe like 2022, private markets maybe get marked down, maybe not, and then maybe stabilize by the time up because public markets, public equities are also rallying again. And that provides a sort of stabilizer, if you will, to the equity beta. The real problem is over the long run, if you're not, if the 
the general partners you're investing alongside, if they're not able to manage those companies well and exit well, then you have you know trapped capital that's not performing or not delivering. And that's the real cost or risk that I think we face. It's less so the drawdown or equity beta per se, and more that the managers don't deliver and that capital is locked up for 12 or more years. Okay. Um, and obviously within income, you have private credit as well. And obviously that's kind of been a big topic of conversation of late, I guess, you know, very strong growth in that side of the industry and mixed views, I guess, you know, um, some, you know, obviously it's a source of opportunity and return for, for investors, but equally, you know, it seems, I mean, anecdotally, at least some of the, 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 rate, the borrowing costs for some of the companies seem very high and, and tend to be a variable rate. So from your seat, do you see that just as an opportunity or are you in any way worried about sort of something systemic in, in the private credit space? Yeah, that's a great question. The, uh, the systemic risk is concerning as we, you know, look to, you know, like you said, on the one hand, we're looking at really attractive rates that we're, uh, that are being reported to us, you know, where these, where any given deal might be inked as of late. Um, but worse so is the underwriting that was done, assuming you're making some assumptions about rates and companies who are bearing that interest rate burden now. But I think as, as long as we're with, uh, you know, we used to call it uh, extend and pretend uh, for the from the macro perspective. When uh, with with regards to policy and you know, solving some of the problems with the banks, and I think that's a, a phrase that we could use at the private credit corporate credit level. However, I think that there is actually some benefit to that if you're collaborating, so to speak, or negotiating with the underlying companies as a GP, and that saves you. You know, maybe it costs you a couple of points from what you might have perceived. From your original underwriting, um, it, it's better than uh, putting that company out of misery, unless that's uh, or putting them into misery, depending on your perspective. Unless that's part of your strategy. So we we invest across uh, the spectrum of you know direct lending or performing credit. There we try and look for smaller manager, or I should say, you know, uh, funds that make loans, smaller size loans to smaller companies, where they are able to have really strict covenants, and um, they're not. You know, price takers, if you will, they are controlling that that obligation. We also invest in like capital solutions or special situations type funds where they are there to you know help out a stressed company. We also invest in in straight distressed or or opportunistic where it's either an off the run situation or it's proper distressed and they'll take over. Maybe it's a way to actually control the equity and. Given we're diversified across those buckets and we have managers who will flex in and out of each of those categories as well, uh, it's not particularly concerning for, for us in our portfolio. We do see it as an opportunity, but it is definitely concerning if, you know, if certain companies that aren't performing well, their interest rate burden is, has doubled or tripled in the last year. Well, one area of your portfolio that's definitely, I, I would say, differentiated is, is, is probably on the defensive side and, and you have as you say, tips and then a, a category called systematic convexity, um, which is, uh, it seems to be trend following macro and uh, and long vol. I mean, that seems to be very much uh, in line with the kind of first responder, second responder kind of philosophy. Is it, Was that kind of in mind when you constructed that portfolio? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I've, uh, I've got a, a fun anecdote, at least I think it's kind of uh, interesting, where I was new to institutional consulting, um, was working my way up to advising clients, uh, supporting some more of the more senior advisors, but being the uh, you know the the mid person, if you will, you know, the client would often call me directly. They could reach me and you know just put me to work uh, directly. And I got a call from a CIO of a state pension plan, and he asked me what our views were on CTAs and uh, strategies like global macro. And I had to say, let me get back to you on that. Um, and uh, did some research and and uh, walked around the office, you know, put put uh, some interesting thoughts together of, you know, we have these fund to fund uh, exposures across a lot of our clients, but as you look through them, it was almost all equity beta oriented in one way or another. Maybe there was distressed debt, you know, event driven, lots of long short equity, maybe some market neutral, mostly U.S. focused, mostly equity beta, hedged, of course, and then. When I looked at the 
the industry data and ran some correlations, you know, some basic work that you might do as a, as a consultant, pull up the HFRI indices, et cetera. Like, wow, this global macro and CTA type strategies are worth considering. What, you know, why, why don't we have more exposure there? Uh, did a bit of research, uh, brought some folks into the office, um, you know, some big names that asked, you know, had educational sessions on what is global macro, how's it different from global, you know, GAA or GTAA, and what's the difference, and what is CTA, what is trend, and and at the end of the day, uh, you know, the firm decided that wasn't something we wanted to pursue for our clients, and uh, believe it or not, this was, I don't remember the exact timing, but it was uh, some point in 2007 maybe early 2007. And uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, certain names and a lot of trend managers did really well in that time frame, as well as, you know, long, long duration, high quality is you know, usually there's a flight to quality bid on, on those types of securities. And so just, you know, learning from that experience of, you know, those are, you know, long lived hedge fund strategies. They're, you know, you, you need to do the homework on how to build this portfolio how to work with these managers, the behavioral risks are really important. And so when we're thinking about this part of the portfolio, by the way, it's, it's 7% of our portfolio. And then we have 5% in uh, what we call GRIPS, which is just a made up acronym for government interest rate products, duration, short-term tips. But when we you, you know, you use the term first responder, and then we talked about the private equity you know, types of drawdowns, et cetera. And our view is we we'd like to we think uh, CTAs and macro can can hedge us against most importantly equity beta, but then secondly or thirdly in, uh, in interest rate risk slash commodity risk or shocks. So we think that's a great tool to have in the portfolio. Obviously, very liquid. When when we put that portfolio together, we're trying to find strategies that have that convexity early on and it's quite strong. Maybe there's a bit of you know whipsaw risk on those faster speeds or uh, macro strategies to have that property as well. And then when we think about what would actually hurt us the most would be a long protracted drawdown, um, something maybe akin to the GFC or worse. Maybe it's maybe the drawdown level is only similar to the GFC at level, but maybe the duration is actually longer. And that's when the private markets exposure, especially private equity, would be uh, most painful for us. And so we do have a somewhat of a bias to medium and long-term trend following strategies as well. We had some experience with tell hedge strategies and we, we decided to move away from those types of exposures. We had some, what we call carry or diversifiers in that portfolio at some point to, you know, kind of pay for the tell hedge. And at the end of the day, we took both of those off and decided we actually just want to trend in macro and especially given kind of the view on the economic regime where you know, maybe cash goes, you know, maybe cash runs at two to 4%, you know, somewhere in there over a period of time, maybe doesn't stay at five, maybe doesn't go higher, but that's a nice backdrop for both trend and macro strategies. And we actually really want that convexity. We don't want it muted by either the carry and we don't want to pay the cost of the tail hedge. We really just want the convexity. So there's a few interesting points to bring up from that. Um, I mean, one, going back to your experience of the firm in 2007, who did all the analysis, um, convinced themselves of the benefit of CTAs from a pure portfolio diversification perspective and still didn't invest. Why, I mean, why do you think that was? And is it, I mean, more generally, it's the question of why more people don't invest. I mean, I have my own views on this, but curious to get your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, you know, it, it is a bit of a mystery. And uh, I, I left out, um, you know, a little bit of extra context after, um, you know, working at RVK. I uh, worked for a hedge fund group in London, and we had both direct and uh, multi manager programs that we uh, offered. And in the multi manager program, there was an allocation. Uh, it's where I got the term defensive and borrowed from this idea is, you know, it had macro and trend, and you know, we had tail for a bit. And it was a standard protocol, right? In in uh, Europe, I'd say it's you know pretty common hedge fund strategy to include in your portfolio. Maybe it's not in everyone's, but more common than in the U.S. And I think there's just this uh, somehow. Maybe it's because in you know when you have your home bias, and you're in the U.S. and U.S. markets have done so well from an equity perspective, private equity, public equity, both. Maybe you think the need for uh, diversifiers is less important. I'm not sure if, if that's quite it. 
And I'm just not sure why these, uh, because people in the U.S. endowments, et cetera, they like hedge funds, they like quant strategies, uh, but for some reason there's a bias against uh, CTAs and global macro, and I can't put my finger on it. I'd be interested to hear what, what your thought is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it depends. I mean, I think in, in some places, uh, people very often people running multi-asset portfolios come from a bond or equity background, and, and they just are not comfortable or are familiar with the strategies. I think that's one thing. Obviously, the return profile is very different and zero correlation means zero correlation. So you will have periods when equities are doing well and, and these strategies are not. And that can be challenging, I know, for, for people to hold. But but no, it is interesting. Um, I guess another point to ask you, I mean, you, you classify them in, in, in the defensive bucket, uh, which I, I guess is, is, is not unusual. But obviously, CJs and macro can in theory, you know, uh, make make uh, returns in, in in many different types of environments, and and obviously at the moment, I, you know, CTAs, I'm guessing would would generally probably be long equities, probably long, possibly long bonds as well. But you know, they have that kind of all weather potential. Obviously, they they, they have uh, uh, drawdowns uh, which can be lengthy as well. Are you looking at them primarily as? diversifiers as vol dampeners or are you actually also thinking of them as uh, return generators yeah good good question the the framework we have set for ourselves is that uh the, the defensive bucket overall needs to be a zero or negative uh equity beta expected or zero correlation and uh, cash or inflation plus two and a half percent return so it's a pretty low return hurdle um, you could think of that as an opportunity cost in some ways. Um, now that cash is, you know, yield is more attractive, uh, yields on bonds are more attractive. Those are part and parcel of that portfolio. But the expectation we have for both macro and trend is, you know, when you know, we we like that the the convexity is is uh, you know two sided, right? Uh, we we want to see both outperformance when markets are drawing down and we'd like to see participation when markets are rallying. We think that's possible for these strategies. I think macro tends to be uh, include some momentum trading. Sometimes it can be quite contrarian. We do have a positive overall modest expected return that I would say is competitive with, for example, what the capital market assumptions are for broad you know, global equity markets. I think you can expect a uh, call it six or seven percent return from a portfolio of trend and macro managers over over the next ten or so years. That's that's a reasonable, if not optimistic, assumption for global equities as well. Absolutely. And I mean people always talk about their allocation to these strategies, but but uh, obviously from a portfolio risk contribution, a, a lot depends on what level of volatility the underlying managers are, are running at. So how do you think about that? Are you targeting a level of vol for that kind of element of the portfolio or just generally looking for kind of typical CTA type vol or, or what's your thought process around that? You know, since we're a, a smaller fund, I mean, three and a half billion is a, a lot of money, but we're, we don't have the resources or capital allocated enough to do separately managed accounts. So our version of capital efficiency is effectively to just go into the highest vol share class that's on offer. And, you know, if fees, you know, vol adjusted fees are, as you know, they're depending on the manager you're working with, but reasonable. It's just, you know, that's uh, from an optics perspective, they're higher on the higher vol share class, but it is more capital efficient. And then these strategies are, are quite diversifying one against the other as well. I mean, they're in some cases doing some similar things, but you know, a fast, a very fast manager trading, you know, intraday or, or at times, you know, shorter than a week and focusing more on, say, vol breakout or um, versus a more simple or what you might call pure trend type of strategy and more medium term and maybe fewer markets. Those, those two are going to be quite different. So we think the, the higher vol can be offsetting. Then most importantly, we zoom out to the total portfolio level. And the contribution to risk when we model this out is actually uh, it's negative, if you will. So you know, we if you show contribution to volatility, you see obviously the public equity portfolios, you know, peak, you know, the one way over on the right, and then you get this small little negative contribution from uh, from the defensive bucket and the underlying and the strategies underlying. 
Yeah, the, the, the one thing I, I think is really interesting is over the year between the GFC, you know, there, there, I think there was an increased interest in trend type strategies after the GFC and macro where people started to think they should be including them. I think some of the fund of funds before they ended up going by the wayside were, you know, lessons learned where we should have some macro and, and CTA or trend type managers. Then I think that interest waned pretty quickly, which I think has happened already here. Uh, in the U.S. in 2023, I think a lot of the managers, right, started adding uh, what we call carry or diversifying components, you know, models to those strategies to reduce that volatility to get a higher standalone sharp. We're not interested in that at all. So back to your volatility, don't we? Not necessarily the higher the better. We want a high volatility because that's how we get that really strong convexity potentially in a big drawdown. Makes sense. Um- as you say, I mean, in theory, you know, getting six, seven percent from a portfolio of CTAs and macro managers should be very achievable. Um, it does bring up the whole topic of manager selection, and you know, uh, you know, I, 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 it's probably very achievable as long as you avoid the, the the small number of managers that have really significant drawdown. So, I mean, from your perspective, having done this for a number of years. What would you see as the pitfalls of manager selection, or or, or, or the things that you try and avoid, um, or, or the, the the kind of the behavioral biases that you have to be aware of when when you're selecting managers? You know, it's um, that's a that's a great question. It's such a difficult job, and I think the soft uh, I was going to say the soft skills, but you know, the qualitative aspects are 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 really important across many of the strategies. I think the to the extent you're trying to get, for example, a cutting edge quantitative type of strategy where, uh, you know, that's probably found in a hedge fund and you want it to be evolving, learning, you know, adopting you know, all the latest technologies, you know, that the culture matters there. You know, are they collaborative and can you understand the research process, who's responsible and, and how those ideas get come from? you know, various sources and from junior folks and are able to make their way up through that, call it trust framework at the, at the investment manager's um, shop. Can that actually happen, be developed successfully consistently? And that would be really important on the quantitative side on those qualitative skills. But sometimes, you know, we're, we've, we've invested with a long standing trend manager who hasn't really updated their model. But I think they, they're not able to raise a lot of assets maybe for this reason, but they have a really interesting track record. And, um, you know, the culture is, you know, maybe really you just need to focus on do the, do they have enough people running that model, executing that strategy who are willing to stay? That's, that's kind of the, almost all of the due diligence for that one. And when you think about other strategies that are you know, more active risk in terms of uh, the fundamental side of things, you know, that that culture aspect can become really important. So trying to understand personality traits or personality characteristics, how they come together at the firm and how that how that decision making framework either avoids or mitigates behavioral biases um, or doesn't hinge too much on one key decision maker who isn't able to be challenged. And those are really, at the end of the day, what we're trying to to assess. And otherwise, you know, we try not to look at the track records and have them inform our decision entirely. But it is it is very powerful in modeling to be able to look at a profile and say, is this what we try to do? Is create these strategy peer groups, for example, and group managers together, and then model their returns so that we can say, is this this must be a strategy beta type that we can model versus just the, you know, the past dependency of one single strategy, you know, one manager, that's um, their particular experience. So we're, we try not to look at, you know, just have they had good performance over the trailing, you know, three, five, seven year period, but look at, um, you know, what the distribution looks like for a strategy type and how it benefits the portfolio. Okay. And I mean, as you say, you try and not to overly emphasize the historic track record, but tends to be difficult to, to to kind of fully remove that from from considerations. I mean, if you're looking at three, four, five trend following managers, would performance be a a, 
an important deciding factor or not generally um, in, 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 in that type of scenario? Yeah, we try to look at rolling time periods and and see where they are in their own individual cycle. You know, maybe there's a strat, you know, maybe a long term or, you know, slower speed managers are underperforming recently. And if you have a type of strategy peer group, that might be an observation you can, you can see. And then, for example, the, the manager I referred to uh, earlier, they're actually in a, in a drawdown right now. And we're pretty happy about that as we're gearing up to uh, work with this manager and invest. And we'd like to see them in a, uh, a 20 plus percent drawdown because it looks like once they've achieved it in a 20 you know they're it's gone further south but uh you know average is out around 20 or so drawdown high vol managers you know pretty normal that's a good time to invest another example uh would be you know when we look at say um you know any kind of strategy we'll look at the manager who maybe has underperformed recently so for example we'll look at 2022 Look at the managers. You know, in, right now we could have really fresh data for, uh, say, public equity strategy. We could see that you know all the managers who are performing really well right now, their end period number, like their one, three, five year number, might look really great because it's so endpoint sensitive. But maybe if we dial it back to 2022, we want to look for who, you know, who actually did well in 2022 that looks poor right now, and what drove that decision. And that's another way of kind of mitigating. You know, when you look at performance and how it might impact your decision is try to look for the manager who's potent, who's underperforming now potentially will outperform in the, over the next course of cycle. All of that sounds very sensible, um, but not necessarily something that would, will always be shared by everybody. I mean, some people will tend to place more emphasis on certain things or more be more likely to kind of um, allocate based on performance. I mean, when how do you construct your own decision making process to to be most efficient? I mean, in terms of your own investment committee, is that do you I guess are you aiming for this diversity of thought? Or do you like to have well, diversity of thought is fine, but everybody has to have a common framework or a common philosophy, or how do you think about that? Yeah, we have uh, we we have a good the good fortune of having a governance framework that was designed by a group of uh, professional investors. And it was put into what we call statute here so that the legal framework, which governs us as a public agency. So we are afforded, our staff at SIPFO are afforded manager selection. Um, we don't need to have our trustees approve the managers we select. So we work in a collaborative process with uh, third parties like consultants or, or advisors or you know other networks or maybe individuals that are trustees as part of the you know, how we, we come to a short list, but once we're working on that short list and really diving deep, we try and limit the decisions, um, for them to move forward to being, you know, the folks on our team who are, uh, shepherding that through the process. And then at certain steps, we open it up to the, the whole team and they are, you know, we'll come to a meeting, we'll come prepared and uh, be able to challenge each other on, you know, what the underwriting assumptions are. But the, the idea is that you should be willing and able to challenge you know, the person who's underwriting the investment manager. That person should be able to receive those challenges without feeling um, like they're being criticized. And all of that needs to happen within a common framework, as you said. So we have uh, investment beliefs that are available on our website. And we also have, uh, w- which include beliefs or philosophies for each asset class as well as uh, we will have a thesis that we set forth before working with a man, before selecting a manager. So, you know, there are things, overarching beliefs, you know, about passive versus active or working with smaller capacity constrained managers. Those things can kind of be true throughout the portfolio. But then maybe if we're looking at, uh, you know, something that's fairly narrow, we'll make sure and develop a thesis or say, you know, venture in Europe. Why are we going to venture in Europe? What's the thesis behind that? What are we looking for when we do go into venture in Europe and then work through the the selection process? So there's principles that, you know, guide our decision-making throughout, but we, the meeting is not going well if everyone's just nodding along and, uh, and thinking that everything looks great. We, we don't want to just have, uh, you know, random questions for, you know, without a solid, uh, fundamental 
you know, point to challenge, but we definitely need to be thorough. And that's the best way we've, uh, it, uh, I think it's pretty similar across allocators in that way. And, um, we just try and optimize as best we can. And ultimately, is it a, a decision by consensus, by majority or CIO kind of final say, or how, how does it go? Yeah, I have the final say on investment decisions. I shape a lot of the decisions early on. We will have team uh, discussions, what we call idea generation, and people on the team will bring ideas from um, you know conversations they're having elsewhere. And we'll socialize those and I'll set, pri- we'll, you know, we'll work together to set priorities, but I'm ultimately giving the direction and ultimately I guess you, I have veto or, or approval power. But if there is anyone on the team who has a strong objection or uh, would like to veto the strategy, if we can't resolve that, then we won't invest in the strategy. So if somebody who's underwriting comes along and says, you know what, I've come to this uh, red flag here. I really think that uh, we can't move forward with this manager any longer. We we might have a discussion. Maybe I'll get on the call with the manager to make sure we didn't misunderstand something. But ultimately, I'm not going to push something forward where somebody's done more work than I have and has come to a conclusion that this is not a good investment. So it is collaborative. It's uh, not it's not a democracy per se, but it is collaborative. And uh, in terms of exits from managers, uh, you know, Making that initial allocation is often easier. It's the kind of the tricky situation of the manager in drawdown and trying to decide if performance is is outside expectations. So how do you think about that? How do you guide the team in terms of thinking about that as well? Yeah, that one's tough because it's easy to get, uh, I don't know if you could say, uh, demoralized around you know manager underperformance and behavioral risk. It's really strong when you're presenting to your trustees and you're showing some underperformance and, and you know, the, the it, it'd be nice to be able to say, you know, this manager has made a mistake, not me. And so we're going to rectify it. Um, really, we, we have to make sure that we understand, you know, why we would be firing this manager in the first place. So we, so we call it a, a pre-mortem and we have a, a checklist of sorts where we go through all the things that could go wrong, have gone wrong in the past or lessons learned that we've borrowed from other folks and we try and make sure that we understand what could go wrong and then we put in our what we call our thesis memo in advance that you know the rationale for firing the manager and so when the manager's underperforming we revisit that statement why would we fire the manager and if it's you know a certain person left or strategy drift or whatever those those elements might be then we have to hold ourselves accountable and make that decision make that determination um we we might actually or i Maybe I might actually be overly patient um, because I've seen the research, really concerned about behavioral biases, and seen a lot of examples of mean reversion at the active manager level that really go against um, you know, firing managers based on short-term performance. So it does happen. Uh, it has happened a few times, uh, but maybe uh, you know, let's let's say a handful of times in the last eight years. And do you find with your pre-mortem, is that pretty good at capturing the, the full set of reasons why you ultimately might get to remove a manager? Or do you find other factors come along that you hadn't anticipated? Other factors come along, yeah. We didn't. Uh, we, we had one manager that was a, a macro manager that we no longer work with where um, the, it seemed that you know, there were some changes on the team, but um, that we we were willing to overlook that because it was one, you know, one key person was no longer on the team, but still at the firm promotion, if you will. And we thought, oh, we, you know, that's not the reason why. And, uh, you know, performance underperformance was, you know, preceded that it was persisting and then it got uh, protracted and maybe worse. And it seemed that as we spent more and more time with the team, that they were losing confidence in themselves and were, were having a hard time sticking to what their thesis was and not that people should be able to change their mind, but it seemed like it came from a place of uncertainty and less so from a place of the process, you know, driving those decisions. And so we ultimately parted ways with that manager, which I think we saved a few bucks, but, um, it was a long, it was a long period of, you know, persisting with the manager with high volatility uh, in the midst of a pretty protracted drawdown. 
Okay, good stuff. Well, I'm conscious of time and uh, we're coming up towards the uh, the hour. So we, we always wrap up by, by just getting our guests to, to offer any advice that they may have for people who are maybe starting off in their careers or people who want to develop a career as a CIO or, or global macro investor. I mean, what are the things that you've done or read that have been particularly helpful in terms of uh, your journey to becoming a CIO? Being intellectually curious is probably the most important thing. If if you're uh, at a high, I mean, at, for any investor, um, being a call it a team leader, being responsible for things like vision and macro strategy, if you will, or just the framework for decision making, as well as being able to look out over time, look across the portfolio and the opportunity set. Really need to be open minded, really curious, and. Um, that means doing a, a lot of reading and a lot of homework. And I, you know, I like the fact that I was a, call it a, a liberal arts major, I studied uh, Russian, learned a lot about Russian culture, Russian literature, learned a lot about the Soviet Union and how those, how that regime operated and that, and then travels quite a bit. And that gave me a really good framework, I think, for looking past, you know, the home bias that we tend to have here. Uh, you sp- I think it's especially pronounced in the U.S., and as if I'm thinking about, you know, my younger self, I talk to a lot of people, but I to find out what I should be interested in and how I should proceed, what pro tips people had, what advice. And I would do as much of that as I could. I have a daughter right now who's, well, I have three daughters all in university and one's looking for an internship. And I, you know, I, I said, try, you need at least a hundred phone calls to really have a sense for you know, talk to anyone uh, tangential at all to what you're interested in. Ask them as many questions as you can. Build on each conversation, or you really have any inkling of what it's like you know to be in that career in that career role or that industry. Um, and I, I think you asked about uh, what maybe what, what books to read. Um, there's a new one that I think a few uh, of us are all talking about. It's by Anna Marshall. I think it's called The Investment Climb to Excellence. I taught a. Uh, uh, I was an adjunct professor for a couple of years here at the University of Utah. I taught an institutional investing class, and uh, I, it would have been nice to have that book. I would have used it as my textbook. Um, of course, we read you know David Swenson's book and Long Term Capital Management, a few others that. Um, but the coursework overall and how that uh, generally followed the nature of that book, which really covers uh, the role of a. Uh, an institutional investor, I should say, maybe an allocator, starting with governance and what that includes and you know, building teams in the process, et cetera. And another interesting book that I think um, allocators should read is, uh, or people who are interested in managing portfolios more broadly, multi-asset class portfolios, is called Strategic Risk Management. It's uh, Cam Harvey, Sandy Rattray, and um, is it Peter Van Otterloo? I'm sorry if I if I've gotten that right. I know, I know the book you're talking about. I have that one as well. Yeah, but uh, um, I know, yeah, Sandy Ray and definitely uh, Cam Harvey. I can't remember the last person, yeah. Yeah, but that the, I think they're all three at MAN or affiliated with MAN or were at MAN one form or another at the time. And that book, I think you know, the, the chapters are pretty straightforward and it's really focused on you know some, uh, I, I don't want to say basic, oversimplified, but those techniques of you know, volatility target, targeting, including trend, um, you know, being mindful of and, and how to manage drawdowns. But those are all tools that I think allocators tend to not um, avail themselves of necessarily because it's a lot of folks want to you know, set the long term allocation and then really focus on manager selection. And I think that's super important. But the risk management piece can be somewhat active as well with some broader tools from quantitative managers like trend managers macro managers that that asset allocators could use as well okay great well that that's a very comprehensive uh, set of uh, uh, of recommendations uh, so peter thanks very much for, for for doing this it's been a great conversation so make sure to follow peter's work because uh, as you can tell from today's conversation it's an uncertain environment we're in uh, and more important than ever to be informed in terms of allocating capital so from all of us here at top traders unplugged Thanks for tuning in and stay tuned for more content. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. 
If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.